Okay. Oh, We're all ready to start um, filming the invited interview. And um, Ian Deary will be interviewed by David Levinsky. We're at the 2015 ISIR meeting in Graz, Austria. Today is December 11th. So, David? Thank you, Doug. And uh, let me just start out by saying how delighted ISIR is to have you here. Um, we've been talking about you for years, and this is the first time uh, the distinguished interviewee is also receiving the very same year the Lifetime Achievement Award. And Ian was gracious enough to do both in the same day, so the graduate students can have a lot of food for thought when they have breakfast with Ian tomorrow morning as uh, part of his Lifetime Achievement uh, <coughs> Award. We, we do that at ISA. So thank you for being here. Well, obviously, thanks for the invitation. It, it, it's such an honor, and I feel like an imposter uh, knowing, as I do, the people that have been interviewed uh, before me. And I must say, this is the closest I've come to the feeling you get in the dentist's waiting room uh, before particularly bad root canal jobs. So uh, there you go, let's see how it goes. I'm also surprised that there's anybody here as well. So. Well, we'll start off with some softballs. Uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about uh, your early educational history? Okay, uh, it's, it's rather strange, actually, because after I left school, my first job was actually as a laboratory technician. So for five years after I left school, I became a laboratory technician and uh, was able at the end of that to be competent in the laboratory aspects of blood transfusion and hematology. So that's how I got until my mid-20s. At some point, somebody nudged me to apply to medical school. And so I applied to go to medical school and as a part of the medical training they have this subject called psychology and this is the University of Edinburgh and we had a few lectures on psychology and when I was doing it for the first time in 1979 they offered psychology as an intercalated degree now this will sound absurd to everybody but I'd done two years of medical school and the intercalated degree in Scotland means that you can then do a year, which is effectively eight months of a subject, and graduate in an honours degree. And so I've done all of eight months of psychology undergraduate as my medical intercalated, and then I went back to medicine to finish my uh, medical studies and became a doctor. So until you know, 1985, I was actually either a laboratory technician or practicing medicine until then, as I say, had done eight months of psychology. So it's a rather strange uh, education for an academic psychologist. How, how did you become interested in intelligence? Well, that was, yeah, I traced that back. I mean, not all of these questions, I have to say, are complete surprises. So I've been able to reflect a bit on this as well. I think the intelligence thing I can trace to a couple of things. First of all, I was in, I think just about the last year in Scotland that were given these IQ type tests to determine which school you could go to. So in England it was famously called the 11 plus and in Scotland we called it the qualifying exam. And so I was from a, a fairly ordinary working class background and uh, I sat this test and suddenly was catapulted into this amazing grammar school, a state school, but everybody around me was talking about going to university, which nobody in my sort of ken had ever done before. So it was a, an amazing event, just sitting this test. I have to confess though as well, I, I worked from an early age at, at, at the weekends, and uh, when I knew this test was coming, I have to say that part of the money I was making I was independent in pocket money from age eight. I actually used to buy some of the practice tests for this uh, IQ test as well. So whether, that, whether that's cheating or motivation, I've never been quite sure. That was one thing that happened. The second thing was, in my medical 
uh, undergraduate degree, we got one lecture on intelligence, one lecture, and that intrigued me as well. But really, the, the, the spur towards doing research on intelligence was, uh, I think, by chance. When we did our interpolated medical degree, we had to do a research project. And you can imagine, I was coming out of two years of medical undergraduate and suddenly realizing as part of this coming degree, I had to do some research in something. I was completely flummoxed. I hadn't a clue what I'd do it in. And so I looked through the usual list of projects that were on offer. And uh, I went to see my advisor. And the first thing I thought I wanted to do was uh, parapsychology. And thank God, Peter, Peter Wright said to me, it's a waste of time, don't even think about it. And so I didn't uh, any further. And then secondly, I wanted to do something on fairly straightforward occupational psychology. And it so happened that the person supervising those projects was actually on leave, and so I couldn't do that. And then he said, well, is there anything else you fancy doing some research on? And then I was scrambling around, I was a bit desperate by this time. And I said, well, this stuff intelligence looks quite interesting. And he said, okay. He said, I'll send you along to Chris Brand, and he'll talk at you for two hours. And what happened was, I did go and see Chris Brand, and my recall is he talked at me for three hours on the very first time that we met. And he introduced me to the world of intelligence, and that was my rather sort of shaky uh, introduction to the field. It wasn't a sort of determined one, but as soon as I learned a bit about it, I got, I got bit. Why, why of all things processing speed to begin your research career? Yeah. Well, one of the first things I was introduced to when I was introduced to intelligence was this thing called inspection timing. I suppose everybody knows about that. I'll, I'll say a wee bit about it. It involves seeing a very simple stimulus of which there are two forms. And it's shown to you for anything between a couple of milliseconds up to a good fraction of a second. <coughs> and Chris Brand had told me at that time that of Ted Nettlebeck's discovery in Adelaide in Australia. And the first thing I, I have to say was I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe these complicated reasoning skills could be related to these early stages that seemed to me all visual perceptual decision making and so it seemed to me almost an impossible thing and the first thing I thought of when he introduced me to it, I obviously had to come up with a research project, was that if it worked in vision would it also work in hearing and that was the first thing I came up with and that was sad as it is what my undergraduate project turned out to be about and also my PhD as well. So I, thought, I suppose it came from surprise and the surprise that something relatively straightforward about perception could be related to complex thinking. And I suppose I've never lost that surprise that these, well, what apparently are lower level things relate to higher level thinking skills. Mm -hmm. Now, you invested a lot of time in your medical training, became a psychiatrist. How, how did you decide to leave that? Leave all that and become an academic psychologist. Well, part of leaving the practice of medicine to become a psychologist was not telling my wife how much salary I was going to lose by doing it. So, uh, but unfortunately, she then began working for doctors and would occasionally see their pay slips, and so that was blown as well. But it was. Partly seeing academics in action when I was doing my intercalated degree, I was very lucky because I was doing psychiatry. I practiced at the Maudsley in London and at the Royal Edinburgh in Edinburgh, and I passed all my exams to become a psychiatrist. And then, in some ways, left it all behind. Although I do come from a family that, that does that, that, that trains in a profession, but then decides to go and do another one. Most of my siblings have, have done the same. And so I, having left behind being a lab technician, and having left behind being a doctor, I decided to take a job where I actually started with a clean desk. And that was the most amazing thing. I mean, it was realizing, and maybe people who, who start in academia and never see anything else don't quite realize this, that if you're a laboratory technician, your work is cut out for you day after day. And pretty much similarly, it, it, practicing as a doctor, I mean, in psychiatry, there aren't a huge number of illnesses. Every individual is fascinating, but you learn pretty quickly that there's all the stuff and the fact that mostly your work is cut out for you. 
But the day I started as a lecturer in psychology, I actually realized that A, I had an empty desk, and people seemed to be paying me just to do what I was interested in, and it's kind of flattering. And also, it's a kind of great opportunity as well. I have to say, though, I kept roots open. So I was a lecturer in the University of Edinburgh in 1985. So that was two years out of medical school. And they gave me a permanent lectureship in psychology. I did my PhD while I was working, and my psychiatry uh, qualifications while I was working as a lecturer in psychology as well. So it was a busy time. So I, I was appointed, I reckon, pretty much nothing to show for my uh, CV, but uh, there you go, I hope I've justified it. <laughs> What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, speaking medical training. So I kept uh, I kept two routes open for quite a long time. So I, I didn't know how this psychology thing was going to go. I was loving it and uh, doing a lot of teaching and starting to do some uh, proper research. And uh, I decided also as a day to keep the option open of going back to psychiatry. But I'm one of those people. I don't think I could have done both well. I think some people can keep a medical career going and do a lot of research, but when I was practicing, I was very conscientious, I wouldn't have time to you know, cut off and, and do a lot of research. So when the research began to build up, and I realized that the quality of life was just so great as an academic, and not least at the University of Edinburgh, I'd say that was the way I was going. Mm -hmm. Now, given your notoriety in cognitive epidemiology, you see pictures all over with the 1932 Scottish Mental Survey. And how, did, how did you stumble upon that survey? Uh, how did you get that initial time on data? Yeah, so this was a, a great stroke of luck, really, was in, in 1997. And in fact, I, I think we can credit Richard Lynn with the discovery to some extent. And so this is rather a, a, a tale of bumbling around by me and my friend uh, Lawrence Holly, who in Scotland was the professor of psychiatry in Aberdeen. And Lawrence had asked me to do some research on a completely unrelated group of people born in 1921, by a coincidence, who had been followed up for cardiovascular disease. And he said to me, would I like to design a set of cognitive tests to test these people with cardiovascular disease? And I actually turned him down. I said, well, actually, Lawrence, you don't actually have any prior ability or pre-morbid ability on these individuals. So testing them now, you wouldn't know where they'd started from. But close to his asking me to do this, and as I say, it was by chance they happened to have been born in 1921, this group, Richard Lynn sent me his book, Dysgenics. And I was reading it at home, and I still remember seeing it, him talking about the 1932 Scottish Mental Survey. And I still have the letter I wrote to Lawrence Wally in 1997 saying, I think everybody born in 1921 in Scotland might have been tested on an IQ test, the same test, on the same day. And also everybody born in 1936. So I said this to Lawrence, and he's a sort of go-ahead chap. He and his wife Patricia, I told him that I think the survey was done by the Scottish Council for Research and Education. And <laughs> They were actually about 15 minutes walk from my office uh, at that time, and Patricia actually physically found uh, those data. That is, Scotland in 1932 had tested 87,498 children on the same test. It was 90% 90, 90 plus of the 1921 born population, and in 1947 uh, they tested 70,805, and each of those was done on a single day, and they kept all these data. And so, as soon as he called me, uh, and he remembers this, I don't remember saying this, but when Lawrence called me to say, Ian Patricia's found these data, I actually said to him, apparently, this will change our lives. Because we instantly saw the, the, the possibilities of, of having these uh, data. So I credit Lawrence for a lot of it, but it was, it was that little, what do you call it, a concatenation of events, of, of all those errors that I've got the book that I was primed by this year of, of birth by somebody else. I saw the book and I thought, oh my god, these, these data might still be around. But so they were, they've been kept confidentially all that time. And so, I don't know if you want to hear this just now, but rolling in front of us, we could just see instantly 
that which other study in the world, studying cognitive aging, had truly a prior ability when, you know, age 11. Actually, we thought age 11 was too young to start with, that they might, the stability of cognitive ability might not be that high because that was too young an age, but of course we, we were disabused of that idea once we started seeing it. So the first thing we did after that was uh, started recruiting up in Aberdeen, where Lawrence was professor. Then a couple of years later, I started recruiting in Edinburgh with some co-investigators as well. So, so she just traced it then to a warehouse, and they were hit just in sitting on racks for all these decades. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, this body, the Scottish Council for Research and Education, was started in 1928. And in the early 1930s, I think it's hard to think back, but IQ tests were still quite newfangled bits of technology. And so when Scotland, in the guise of the Scottish Council for Research and Education, went to an international conference uh, funded by Carnegie and led by Edward Thorndike, and took place at a nice hotel in Eastbourne in the United Kingdom with a whole group of Europeans and Americans. And what they did was they were gathered together to study the problems of education. It was called the International Examinations Inquiry. They were worried about fairness at school examinations and how to assess children. And all these countries got together, it was amazing, sort of collective, and they gave each country a job to do, a research job. And Scotland said, we will test the whole country's intelligence. That will be our part in the job. And that's what they did. On uh, June the 1st, 1932, they, they tested everybody on one of Godfrey Thompson's uh, Murray House test, and that's why it was done. And what happened after that was that this body, the Scottish Council for Research and Education, moved house. And thank goodness they didn't throw away these data. It would have been very easy not, uh, to throw them away because they weren't using them for, for anything. And so eventually I uh, discovered them, got permission uh, confidentially to transcribe them, and then to contact people through a third party asking them if they wanted to come back and take part in these follow-up studies of uh, cognition over all these years, and we started to build up the, the cohorts that way. Yeah. So how, how did you go about that move from the boxes to the whole concept, the whole field of cognitive editing? <coughs> yeah, that's kind of a different thing actually there, because the, 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 first, the first thing we wanted to do was find out how stable cognitive ability was from childhood into old age. And we wanted to do it because precisely the reverse. We wanted to find what are the factors that lead toward instability. In other words, if the stability was, say, about a half, which it turned out to be, what would actually cause people to do relative to others, relatively well or badly? Would it be genetics? Would it be lifestyle? Of course, we were putting our money on lifestyle at that point. And then uh, one day in, in my office in Edinburgh, uh, Lawrence and I looked at each other and said, do you know what, and again, none of us, and neither of us can remember who said it, was that when we're finding out who's going to come back, we're also finding out who's died. And we said, I wonder if their ability at age 11 is related to whether they've survived all this time. And it was one of these completely ignorant questions we'd neither of it, well, I certainly hadn't done any epidemiology, I had to learn a, a new set of statistical skills. And we decided we would do this thing that we only later called cognitive epidemiology. In fact, it was in my science article where it was some, called something like Reaction Time Explains IQ's Association with Death. And I think that's exactly what it's called. I wrote rather cheekily in the new field of cognitive epidemiology. And I remember being pulled up by my colleague Jeff Dare, who's my co-author, and saying, what's this you've just invented? And I think, we'd better give it a name. So we gave it a name at that point. But what Lawrence and I were doing was asking a very naive question. Was childhood ability uh, related to survival uh, after all these years? And I don't want to go over my entire uh, the bit I did my lecture again, but at that point we weren't doing the linkage uh, by computer. We did it physically, so we, we got permission to look up the information on everybody, about the 3,000 people who took the test in Aberdeen, and tried to find, to find out whether they were alive or dead, and it was painstaking. Lawrence's daughter, uh, Elizabeth, did a lot of the the legwork of going to register house to find death certificates and marriage certificates and compiling all the information. 
And it was an interesting process. It's basically when we uh, eventually found that there was an effect that is, on average, I'll, I'll, I'll increase the effect size from this morning by saying that, on average, a girl who's got a 30 point advantage in intelligence at age 11 is twice as likely to survive to age 76. So that was the kind of size of the effect we were reporting. And we got a series of shrugged shoulders. I mean, I, I, my memory is we tried science and nature and the Lancet, and eventually the <coughs> medical journal uh, took it. It's not bad, but uh, from all the others, we got uh, the, the thing that we hadn't measured social class and education properly, and probably these things were, were explaining it. So cognitive epidemiology started from a very naive question of we were calling people back, and was there any association between their original ability score at age 11 and the people who hadn't survived in order to come back? And from there, you are now director of this Medical Research Council Center for Cognitive Aging and Cognitive Epidemiology. How did that come about? How did that directorship and title come about? Yeah, well, well, so let me deal with that after a semicolon, actually, because the center's got a weird name, and uh, the, the administrative secretary of the center curses me for that long name because she's got to say it every time she picks up the telephone. <laughs> and it's too long. And it would never have been cognitive epidemiology had it not been for another character called uh, David Batty. So David Batty met me at a conference <coughs> once, and he's an epidemiologist. And he came up and said this association between cognition and childhood and survival was fascinating and was a really new thing in uh, epidemiology and we should be doing a lot more of it. And I have to credit him for realizing the potential of the area and turbo boosting it. And David is just one of these amazing people I've been really lucky to work with. And this isn't flattery or modesty, it's just the plain truth that he was amazing in getting studies like the Malmo study, the Swedish conscript study, the Vietnam experience study, etc, etc, etc and assessing them for different aspects of cognitive epidemiology because as an epidemiologist he wanted to know what's mediating uh, th th this effect, what are, the, what are the mechanisms of it and so really by the time I was asked to put the centre together uh, I was ready to say that we were doing cognitive ageing but I wanted cognitive epidemiology to be maybe not on an equal footing but part of the actual enterprise so this is what happened now let me just think of the date, so we're around the mid 2000s now towards the mid to the end of the, the, the 2000s and we're running the, the Lothian birth cohort, by this time we've got the Lothian birth cohort of 1921 up and running quite nicely, uh, the Lothian birth cohort of 1936 up and running quite nicely and I've decided that I will sort of uh, splash out and try and get brain imaging done and uh, genetics done and all these individuals and when you take it, we originally had 1,500 people, and some of these things cost several hundred pounds per person. You've got to multiply that and reckon the funding I was trying to bring in. And so the Medical Research Council had put out a call for centres on ageing. And uh, the, the soon-to-be Sir John Savile, who at that time was the head of the medical college at the University of Edinburgh, called me and said I should uh, put in a bid for one of these centres and my immediate reaction was well actually we're doing quite a lot already and, and that would be a, a move too far and that there were other people who I immediately thought of to, to give that particular uh, hot potato to but Sir John Savile is not the person to whom you say no and he said no Ian you weren't listening properly is my rem memory of it he said you're going to put in a bid for a centre on uh, on, on ageing and so I thought about it and it was the one time I was prepared to be relatively uh, difficult if, 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 uh, if I can put it like that insofar as I wanted to do, if I was going to, I never wanted to run anything and so if I was going to run something I wanted to run it on my terms and so I put together this bid for a centre that would look at normal cognitive ageing so the most obvious thing to look at is dementia. And I reckon, well, actually, we're not 
in our studies, world class on dimension. But what we are is world class, I thought, in normal cognitive because this advantage we had with the baseline information. And that I would bring in David Batty, who by that time had moved up to Glasgow, which is a big city to the west of uh, Edinburgh. And uh, that was a joke. Uh, and, uh, so David was up in, in, in uh, Glasgow by then. And I formed my centre into several groups and made him the leader of the group that was called Cognitive Epidemiology. And there was a lot of pressure to make it include things, uh, various medical conditions. I said, no, let's keep it like that. Let's keep it like cognitive aging and cognitive epidemiology. And then I started writing a shopping list. I said, okay, if we're going to do it, let's get some useful core staff. And so I, I wrote a shopping list of 10 core staff. I put down things like a statistician, geneticist, another geneticist, IT, knowledge exchange, etc, etc. And I was absolutely shocked when we got everything that we asked for. Not only that, but uh, five years later when we came to renew the centre, one was told that the, the thing to do, of course, was to go back to the Medical Research Council and tell them, oh God, this is actually being filmed. Never mind, here we go. Um, <laughs> what one's supposed to do is tell them how generous they've been to ask for less the next time around. I said, no, let's not, let's ask for more because we're doing so well we should not just introduce a PhD programme, which we had by that time, we should actually introduce a postdoctoral programme as well. And surprise, surprise, we got that just, just over a year ago. So we're into another five years of, of this centre, so I'm still running things, I expect that I've never particularly wanted to run things. And it's been successful, and, and this is how I'd, I'd, I'd assess that, insofar as at the University of Edinburgh, we'd already been collaborating with quite a number of different people from different colleges and different specialities. But it's nice to have a, a focus for their efforts. So collaborations are all very nice, but if you can offer things like a lot of valuable core staff, and if you can bring in people like PhD students, it creates a cohort and a community that's focused around the one thing. It does give it an identity that it didn't have before. And so again, if, if one looks at the productivity, something that again, <coughs> I think I was incorrectly reluctant uh, to get involved in was, was actually it's so very successful in, in giving another boost to the to, to the efforts. So after the discovery of the cohorts and setting those up, I think the you know, the, the centre was pretty good. And the other nice thing for, for the university is it's I think it's the only medical research council centre in uh, Scotland. It's not in a medical faculty. It's actually in a college of humanities and social sciences. It's rather nice that we harness the power of, of people from other places into our, into our college. Your, your contributions have been incredible, not only in, in science, but in teaching and training. And a lot of people, I think, wonder, given all you have on your plate, what motivates you to write textbooks on intelligence and personality during <coughs> What motivates me? Annoyance is, is what motivated me. So uh, the, the first book, uh, I know what you mean. It's a real, it's a faff writing a, a book. And uh, so the, the first book I wrote was with Jerry Matthews, a, a friend who's, who's uh, over in the States now, was in Dundee originally. And Jerry and I used to talk about how annoyed we were at the way personality appeared in all the introductory <coughs> textbooks. Um, I remember Hans Eysenck calling it a walk through the graveyard, and that's what it seemed like. It was this series of dead theories, along with things like traits, and all described as if they were equal. And Jerry said, well, no, let's write a book that tells the truth. And so we wrote this book for Cambridge University Press, it's now in third edition. And uh, we called it personality traits. And we reckoned there wasn't really anything about personality that couldn't be oriented around the foundation of traits. And so it was just that it was annoyance. I mean, that sounded like, like a glib remark, but it was. It was frustration that you couldn't, we didn't think, get a book. Of course, subsequently, things have, uh, books have come out that, that do a better job. But at that time, we didn't know that there was a book that did a good job of describing uh, uh, personality uh, like that. So that was the first one. The, the, the reason I wrote uh, the, the book, uh, Looking Down on Human Intelligence, was also annoyance. 
So ever since, as I've described earlier, my undergraduate uh, days and into my PhD and, and times lecture, I've been working on this thing called processing speed. And I was interested, in, and I'm just by, by nature a reductionist, and so I want to know why some people are smarter than others, and why some people age uh, <coughs> than others, and I want to know the mechanistics of that. And so, with regard to intelligence, I bought into this idea that things like inspection time and maybe reaction time could offer you a simpler uh, cognitive aspect or even fractionation or cognitive components that might explain, and I use that term advisedly, might explain why some people were uh, brighter than, than others. And then of course I went further down and, and did a bit in the book on genetics and bits on brain imaging as well. But it turned out to be a kind of funny book because there are uh, chapters and uh, I think Alyosha it was you I sent a chapter to, is that right, at one point. It was actually the, the one on processing uh, speed if I, I recall. And he wrote back to me and I wish I'd called the book now. I mean, it's got a bad enough title, it doesn't tell you enough about it anyway. So I could have made it even worse but, but more literary by using Alyosha's title. And he said, this is Den Finger in the Wunderlegen. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And he said, basically, Ian, you've just written this book to poke holes on all the worst wounds in our area of research. And so basically, I wrote a book saying how terrible the area that I'd been researching uh, for, for, for several years was, and that really, I didn't think that cognitive fractionation had worked with regard to explaining intelligence differences, and that I kind of reverted to my medical background and, and concluded that really neuroscience, I mean, particularly brain imaging and, uh, and genetics was the way forward. Although I have to confess, I, I picked the wrong horse with regard to brain imaging. I picked functional, when in fact everything we're doing now is structural uh, brain imaging. I'm not saying functional is not going to answer anything, but we've got a lot more out of structural brain imaging just now than we have out of uh, functional brain imaging. So the reason I wrote that book was I was, I was annoyed and, and also it was kind of a double annoyance. I wasn't happy with the way the field was going, and I was thinking that those of us within it were too glib about saying, calling things like elementary cognitive tests, and I thought, no, that's not right, we don't know that they're elementary. But at the same time, people outside the area were also dismissing it too glibly as well. So I wanted to do something, if it was going to be demolished, I thought it should be de demolished by somebody who was actually in it and believed in the, you know, the effort. I just wanted a spring clean so that we could actually do a better job. And so I mean, a lot of it, in fact, is the stuff that appears in intelligence. And I was arguing for a sort of proper self-criticism of the concepts that we were using. I, I wasn't saying there was anything wrong with the, the good empirical stuff. It was more the, the interpretation of, of some of the work. So that was the annoyance. And as I say, it turned out to be a, a sort of a funny book. And, and one of the nice things about this, and uh, I don't know if one should say this about myself, but anyway, it got the Surprisingly, the British Psychological Society's Book Award for, for the year after it came out, and so I was delighted at that. But at the at the presentation for it, the chap who was awarding it said, Ian, he said, you're very lucky to, to, to get this. And of course, I already thought that anyway. But uh, he, he said, this book's got a really boring title. And it was called Looking Down on Human Intelligence, colon, from psychometrics to the brain. But he said, as soon as you open it, he said it's full of jokes and literary references and, and sort of good interpretation. I thought that was really nice. He'd actually bothered to read it. And uh, so it was, a, it was a boring book. But, but what happened then, that was published by Oxford University Press. I only really wrote it for the field. And so I, I doubt whether the sales of that have, have yet gone into four figures. But Oxford then bullied me into writing another book called Intelligence, A Very Short Introduction. And boy, I did not want to write that book. And the trade people kept on at me and said, well, somebody will write it about intelligence who doesn't know about the field and just make a bad job of it. And so what I did was, for, for many months, I, 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 I work early in, in, in the morning. But I spent three hours every morning for, for a long time just writing the draft of this book, Intelligence, a very short introduction. And I didn't look uh, at a at a single paper as I was doing it, insofar as I could. In other words, I wanted to write it straight off the top of my head, but I also wanted to write it uncompromisingly. That is, I said, this isn't going to be my opinion. What I wanted to do in that little book was actually give the reader the data. And so it's rather an unusual thing. And so I spent a long time choosing my data sets so that I would just talk them through, I think it was a dozen data sets that were, well, I used the 
phrase this morning, the sort of data sets are very powerful and that people can't argue with very much. I shan't use it again here, but uh, I, I talk them through these data sets to try and give them an even-handed account of intelligence differences. And it was a surprise because whereas I, I slaved away in my labour of love looking down at human intelligence and it's been seen by a few folks, even my mum hasn't read that. And uh, this little book has, at the last time I looked, sold well over 30,000 copies. You know, uh, they, even, I think this year, we'll still put the turkey on the Christmas table. So it's rather, uh, rather surprising. The book I wrote after that, you probably didn't want an account of every book, but this is the last one, so don't worry. Uh, the book after that was A Lifetime of Intelligence with the American Psychological Association. And it was the first 10 years of research on the Scottish Mental Survey. <laughs> and I just wanted to write what we'd been doing because everybody complained that we published the work all over the place in epidemiology, in medical journals, in psychology journals, everywhere. And everybody keeps saying, well, we never know this stuff because we keep coming across papers that we've never heard of before. And why don't you put it all in one place? So, decided to do that, and it was another one of those. I took, I, for that one I took a year, and um, for Monday to Thursday, every week for a year, from 7 to 10 in the evening, after an early dinner, I wrote. And then I showed the copy to John Starr and Lawrence Wally, and they edited it, and then we, we published it. But the reason I was laughing earlier is that looking at it now, it's quite a nice account of the history of the survey and some of the early research, but there's one chapter that's just so embarrassing now, because there's a chapter on genetics, and most of it is on candidate gene work, as it would be, because it came out in 2009, before the, the era of, of, of GWAS, which was finished the year before that. And most of those haven't replicated, like most candidate gene studies. The APOE has. Uh, God, why is APOE? Uh, it's the, it's the first one that we have in, in cognition, but most of those other things haven't replicated. So I think all the chapters stand up pretty well, probably, except, well, they're the things we found at the time, of course, but in, in terms of uh, replication, it's the, the candidate gene that I haven't replicated so well. Uh, that's very interesting. It's, it, it's so obvious that you're thoughtful in thinking about how to invest your time and what is needed for the field and you want to maximize impact like, like most successful academics. I also know that you invest a lot of time in lecture and how, how do you think about and how do you work out that balance for yourself? Because you always have data to write out. You always have students to meet with. How, how do you decide on what lectures to do, how much time you should invest in teaching because a lot of people are wrestling with that. Yeah, well, life has life has changed now that I, I head up this centre because one of the things I wasn't going to compromise on was doing it properly. And so right from the beginning, I said I had to be eighty percent devoted to the centre, or I wasn't going to do it, and that's worked out very well. And so now I opt to do some. Uh, graduate teaching, but I also, I still like to do the introductory lectures for the first year psychologists, so the 300, 350 students we have who take the introductory lectures, I lecture them on personality and intelligence and still enjoy that uh, very much. But I remember way back, I, David, I, because I'd come into academia, as I say, after two years uh, from graduating, I, I had no academic mentors and I didn't know what you're supposed to do. So at the beginning of my academic career, and everybody will think this is terribly naive, I, I, I took it as a sign of a compliment if somebody asked me to do some lecturing. And so I always said yes, and I was very flattered that somebody wanted me to do some lectures. Until one day, uh, a great friend of mine who we published some of the early intelligence work together, Peter Carroll, came and said to me, Ian, he said, you're doing twice as many lectures as the next busiest person in the department. It's time you started cutting some of these. So it's a long time since I've been in that position, but I must say at one time, but that was great because everybody knows that lecturing is one of the best ways to learn. Because if you've actually got to teach somebody about something, you want to be reasonably confident you've understood it yourself. I should have said better than reasonably there that day then. That's what extemporizing does for you. Uh, so anyway. <laughs> Uh, but now, David, perhaps you're also referring to the fact that I give a lot of talks and I try to make half of those talks to the public. 
So I'm obviously going to give academic talks like, like say, coming, coming here, but I try and give about half of my talks to lay audiences and policy audiences as well, and I get a big kick out of that because I think it's quite nice to, uh, uh, to do that. So for example, I'll, I'll tell you about one particular uh, thing I've done, it's an unusual form of a lecture. Uh, in maybe it's the UK broadly, I think it is, we, we have this phenomenon called the Café Scientifique. Do, do you know this? Yeah, some of you do. And so I was invited to do one, in fact I've done two now, in Edinburgh. And the setup, for those of you who don't know, is quite terrifying. You're allowed no slides, that's the first thing. And they're always in public places, and the ones I've done have been in the, the café bar of the Edinburgh Film House, which is the Edinburgh uh, Film House for arty type films. And you've got to go in and just start talking and get their attention when they've got better things to do. And I've enjoyed that challenge. And the last one I did was, uh, I rather, I, 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 you'll see what I did here, when I, I titled it 10 Reasonably Interesting Things About Intelligence. And so I would take them through various things that you'll all know about, whether there's one or many, what happens in ageing, etc., etc., whether it's heritable or or down to environment, because I think it's quite nice to get straight to people and beyond the sort of opinion editorial pages of, of various newspapers to actually tell them what it's about. And it was the same mission, I suppose, that I had with Luke A, with Intelligence, a very short introduction, was to try and take people straight to data and say, this is what the data say. Don't, don't worry about opinions. Don't even believe what I say. This is what this data set's like. And if you don't like my interpretation of it, I'm, I'm giving you access to where it actually is to, to go and get it as well. And so a lot of my frustration is, is the fact that as soon as you hear about intelligence, you hear the word controversial, and most of the time that's needless because in mm -hmm. fact, you know, a, a good look at the data would, would bleach that controversy. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the most important questions remaining to be answered in the field of intelligence? Well, I think it's largely mechanistic questions I would, uh, I would focus on there, and I, I, I apologise, I'll focus on ones that we're interested in. I'm still fascinated by the empirical finding that uh, ability or cognitive ability in youth is associated with survival, uh, with lots of different ways of dying, with health and illnesses, and I don't think we've nailed that one yet. I think we're still looking for the, the mediators of, of that effect. So again, that's rather a personal one. I'm still a reductionist. I'd still like to know what the, the brain mechanisms of keeping one's cognitive capabilities through life are and being brighter in, the, in well, I was going to say in the first place, but what I mean by that is in, is in early youth when when disease mechanisms haven't kicked in, so I'm still looking for the, uh, the mechanisms there, so I would, I would focus on, on that side of it, if I could try and answer some of those questions. Be, beyond what you're doing, where, where would you like to see the field go in the next 20 years? Yeah. Actually, I've kind of done that before, because it was Gosh, 15 years ago now, when looking down on human intelligence came out, so 15 is most of 20. And so at that time, I was looking forward and saying that I thought it was going to be in neuroscience. And I think probably the, the field has developed slightly less quickly than I would have imagined. At that time, I would not have thought that, say, 54,000 subjects in a GMAS of intelligence would have delivered as little by way of genome-wide significant hits and explaining variants in intelligence. So I know that that's got to get bigger and better, as of the number of people that are in brain imaging studies as well. And also, over 20 years, if you think back, and again, there's people in the audience who can do this a lot better than I have, because I work with good brain imaging folks, I'm stunned by how much brain imaging has come on in that time as well. So the way we can say, even assess the, the structure of the brain has come on a great deal in 20 years, especially the white matter that we've been particularly focused on in our studies as well. So I would hope the developments along those lines do these uh, non-invasive uh, studies of the, of the brain. Mm -hmm. What do you consider your most uh, important scientific contribution? Yeah, that, that's kind of 
when did you stop beating your wife, Chris? You made that, that, that supposes that you've made an important contribution in the first place. Uh, if, okay, this, this is going to be prefaced by an if. If anybody said to me, that chap Deary is sort of even handed when talking about intelligence, which can sometimes be a tricky topic, I would be really flattered. And of course, there probably people in the audience think, well, no, he's on one side of the argument. But if anybody said, if I, I gave a reason to even handed the account of the field, I would be absolutely uh, delighted. But obviously, some of the, uh, the headline things that were done with colleagues like the the discovery of, of childhood IQ relating to survival, like the stability of intelligence across all that time. You know, obviously those are, those are extremely pleasing uh, things to have brought out, not least because they're, you know, they, they, they were either first or unlikely to be repeated. You, earlier today, gave, gave a brilliant talk. Astonishing view of a spectacular research program. What can you can you single out two or three of your papers that you're really the most proud of? Yeah, sure. Well, I think David, it's kind of you to say about that about the talk. If, about if 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 it's managed to convince you that you should be listening to ambient electronica, I would be absolutely <laughs> delighted. I would consider that a signal, a signal of success. If, one of the papers I'm proudest of is, is my very first peer-reviewed paper. I mentioned earlier that uh, I had this ridiculous uh, sort of early thing where I'd co-written a chapter with uh, Chris Brand and it appeared in a book by, by Isaac. That was 1982, but I actually published a paper in 1982 because I'd done a, a vacation job the year before when, when I was at medical school. I had to work during the vacations because I was already married with children when I was at medical school. And so I published a paper in a journal called Vox Sanguinis, The Voice of Blood. And uh, it's not much cited, but I'm really, <laughs> really proud of it because this is, this is what we did. In, this is from my blood transfusion days. In blood transfusion, it's very important to have antibodies to test for reactions to blood. And there are certain types of antibodies that don't work very well, and you've got to G them up with a catalyst of some type. But I worked with a, a, a chap, and we came up with a, this idea that if you stuck these antibodies onto dead Staphylococcus aureus cells, this is a bacterium, you could turn them into much better antibodies, and they could work without the help of this catalyst. And it worked absolutely beautifully. And we sent in a patent for it. So this was great. I mean, this is a medical undergraduate. I already had a patent application and, uh, and the paper. And this looked like an amazing method. And it, what was really annoying was the very next year, uh, monoclonal antibodies were devised and it completely made our thing redundant. So we made this amazing method that almost instantly was made completely redundant and uh, Victorian almost. But anyway, it was a really neat idea uh, that we've come up with. But, uh, okay, which, which ones am I proud of? Uh, well, I, 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 you've got me just going over the same sort of stuff. Yeah, there is, there is a couple that I haven't mentioned so far. There was a, I'm really proud of me and my team, me and my team getting a null paper as a full letter to nature. That was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Because what happened was that uh, we'd been working on the the CAGES consortium, Cognitive Aging Genetics in England and Scotland. And by this stage, Peter Vischer and his colleagues, especially Jin Yang, had invented the GCTA method for estimating heritability based on DNA. But in discussion with Peter, it had been used in a univariate way so far, but in fact, they had made an extension of it to the, the, the bivariate situation. So you could use GCTA to estimate genetic correlation as well. And so we'd been doing other things, and I said, Peter, we should write this up. And it wasn't on their priority list. And I said, oh, this really is an interesting result. And so we published the genetic correlation between childhood and older age ability. And I think, if I recall correctly, that was something like 0.62. And because of GCTA, it's got quite a big standard error, but it was significant. But the more interesting thing was, we estimated 
the genetic contribution or the genetic contribution to cognitive change to be 0.24. Now that said, that about 24% of people's variation in how much their cognition changed from childhood to old age was down to genetic factors and about three quarters down to the environment. But that 0.24 point estimate had a standard error of 0.2. Yeah, okay, so it's only an audience like this that would get that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, but nature took it, and they said, look, this is incredibly rare. That, that's the way I read the referee's comments anyway. And so effectively, that was the most interesting, I mean, other, I, I'm kind of slightly underplaying this, but it had other interesting results, but that for me was the headline result, and it was non-significant. And it was, uh, it was in nature, that was nice. But another nice one was this, and again, this goes to one of my young colleagues, and, and there's several of them. Uh, Michelle Luciano and uh, Jenny Corley, etc. But this is, we often get complimented for our work on reverse causation in the Lothian birth cohort. So let me just, let me take an example. It's the best one. I could take inflammation C-reactive protein, or I could take caffeine, or I could take intellectual engagement, but let me take alcohol. Because some people drink alcohol. I don't actually, but some people do. And uh, some of the Lothian birth cohort drink alcohol. Not very much, they're modest drinkers, but we found, and this is Jamie Corley's work, that uh, the people who were drinking more alcohol had better cognition at the age of about 70, and especially if they drank a bit of red wine. And of course, if I give this comment to a, a lay talk, everybody starts cheering at, at that point. Uh, anyway, and then I can say, well, actually, you've celebrated too early, because what we were able to show is that that contemporaneous association between alcohol drinking, especially red wine, and <coughs> cognition is almost nullified if you take into account the cognitive ability 60 years previously in the Scottish mental survey test. In other words, it's not that alcohol seems to boost cognitive ability in older age, it's that children who start being bright go into a lifestyle that's associated with drinking a bit more red wine and probably in the UK listening to Radio 4 and reading The Guardian and that, that sort of middle class thing. If you're bright and, and sort of middle class in Britain, you have to listen to The Archers, by the way, as, as, as well, which I've done religious thing. I still hate it. I still have no idea who anybody is uh, in it either. But anyway, that, that sort of reverse causation or confounding was really interesting. We started to find it with some biological things as well. We'd found this thing called C-reactive protein, which is a blood marker for inflammation was associated with cognition in older age, and people might have interpreted that as thinking, okay, stop your inflammation and you'll save your cognitive ability. Well, it wasn't that. It was that the brighter children were ending up being less inflamed in, in older age. So it seemed to be a cognitive epidemiology discovery, not a cognitive aging uh, discovery. So I'm, I'm pleased with those kind of, maybe that's just a, that's a slightly mischievous thing in me, that I, I like to pull the rug from under people's feet by showing them what they thought originally was, was in fact wrong. Well, yeah. yeah. What, what is your uh, greatest professional regret? Yeah. Can, can, I, can I pick a sort of wee one and, and, and the big one? This goes back to this thing of, of being sort of a very naive uh, academic as well. When, when I was an undergraduate, uh, in medicine one, one has to do uh, 16 weeks of what's called an elective. And you can do almost anything. Most people go abroad to work in hospitals. But I was lucky enough to be introduced to Hans Eysenck, who introduced me to Elaine and Alan Hendrickson. And they introduced me to a biochemistry laboratory in Bath, who knew I'd been a lab technician. So I spent my happy 16 weeks fractionating rat, <coughs> rat and human fetal brains to make things called postsynaptic densities. And I was supposed to be testing a, a hypothesis of the Hendricksons, but I got rather distracted and I was looking at these postsynaptic densities in human, human fetuses and I noticed that there was a, a cell organelle called, I'm really losing the audience now, uh, there was a cell organelle called the centriole that was associated with it. And so again, as a, a, an early stage undergraduate, I sent this discovery complete with all, I did all my own electron microscopy, I did all my own ultracentrifugation, everything. And I, I sent it off uh, to the Journal of Cell Biology, it's a big journal. And they sent it back, uh, which I now realise was asking for a minor revision. 
And I was so naive, I actually thought they didn't want it and never, <laughs> and never published it and got really annoyed that they, they didn't want it. And so that's a real regret and that still annoys me after all these years because to have got a, a, a sort of first author journal of cell biology as an undergraduate and I was within a whisper of getting it. However, that was uh, perhaps a, a quirk and shouldn't, maybe that... No, that was a good one. Maybe that, maybe that gives too much away about me. But, but one thing I've, I've kind of regretted, I think, I think the centre, and this is maybe being disarmingly honest, I mean, the, my being nudged towards putting the centre together was a good example of sometimes what you think your ambitions are aren't the best things, that you need a nudge from outside to do something that properly takes you to the right level. And I sometimes wonder if we've missed the boat a bit with the follow-up of the Scottish Mental Surveys. Uh, people won't know this, but, but in the west of Scotland, in the middle belt of Scotland, there's 75 plus percent of the Scottish population. And uh, Glasgow, and in its area, is, is more than twice as big as Edinburgh. And I never went through to Glasgow to recruit a much bigger sample of the uh, Scottish Mental Survey. So Lawrence did it in Aberdeen population of 250,000 Edinburgh, about half a million to Glasgow and its area around it is a million plus. And I think, you know, now that they've got older, there was a, there's a limited window to do it and maybe you're thinking, well, come on, you can't complain, it's been reasonably productive. But we, we, could, have, uh, we could have got bigger, I think, uh, earlier, uh, earlier on. But the other thing, and this isn't a regret, it's that I think it's clear, and I hope it came across this morning, but the one thing I really enjoy is, is, is uh, having a team of bright sparks around. I mean, I think we have good fun in our team doing research. I've never lost that fun you know, aspect of doing research as well. But sometimes I've thought, I really admire the, the solo researcher who manages to go on you know, year after year doing the, the, the single author publication. So I think of people who are the obvious ones, Jim Flynn, and uh, Tim Salthouse, both of whom I know well and admire, and they're great fun as well. But they haven't built up huge teams. They, they, they've done really fantastic research and, and kept fairly solo. Is that fair to say? They're fairly solo compared to the sort of team thing. So I'm usually you know, sort of the, 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 the last man on a football team when it comes to publications uh, these days. And of course, I try and keep the occasional first author. I think you need that. But at the same time, I, I, so it's not a regret. It's just that. I can see that was another way of doing things, and I, and I admire that as well. I think there's, there's different ways to skin that particular cat. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, no animals were harmed in that statement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what, one of the things that um, graduate students, uh, postdocs, and even just assistant professors in particular like to hear from someone of your stature is, what, what advice would you give to the younger generation now uh, in terms of developing their career? Yeah, well, having stumbled uh, through mine, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a good person to, to give advice. I, I, I thought about this, David, and I, I, I can't uh, I can't say that I haven't jotted down a few things, and I, I see I wrote something, a word I think I think I invented, but I mean it's probably out there anyway, uh, and I'll do that first, which is a uh, phenocopy. I like the word phenocopy, which I, I used to mean this, if you learn that being conscientious is a good thing, you don't need to be conscientious, you just need to copy people who are conscientious, and that's what I mean by phenocopy. And if you see somebody who's naturally doing the right things in academia, I don't think you naturally have to do them. I think you can try and phenocopy the person that's doing them. So look around you for a good uh, example of, of how to do things well as well. There's a couple of other things I, will, I have too, is that it's good if you can identify a big question straight away and not just nibble at something. I mean, I, I see it... In, when you've got a, a big, ripe data set with lots of low-hanging fruit, I find it interesting how some people will go for the big, low-hanging fruit straight off, and some people will look off in the periphery and look at some mangy little thing that's fallen into the undergrowth. Oh God, I never thought this metaphor was going to... Okay, right, uh, but you see what I mean. Some people will naturally go to the margins and start fiddling around with some minor, sort of little tricky thing, rather than go for the big thing. 
So for example, uh, I remember going to um, ISIR, <coughs> it might have been the one that you hosted in Nashville, and seeing uh, Wendy Johnson speak, and I think it was around the time it was the just, just one G, and I thought, this is somebody doing their PhD, and they're just doing this absolute cracker of a paper, just one G, and her follow-up, still just one G, the revenge, <laughs> no, just still just one G, and uh, they were just brilliant things, and I thought that's a big question, that somebody identified as part of their PhD, and it's just a lovely thing, and it just knocks on the head all sorts of criticism uh, of, of the things, that's a good thing to do as well. I would also say know your history. Uh, that, that can sound a bit boring, but it, it pays off as well, because, again, I remember as an undergraduate uh, on, on a train journey sitting with my copy of Spearman 1904, I think it's 123 pages long, somebody will look up their iPhone and tell me it isn't in a minute, but uh, <laughs> I remember reading that through and surprising my supervisor at the University of Bank, he said, nobody ever reads Spearman 1904, and I thought, well, I'd be citing it, you know, you should actually know what it is, so I think knowing it, and uh, <coughs> Spearman's books, for example, I don't just mean Spearman, that's just what came to mind, are absolutely poaching, I think that's a Scottish word, it means alive with, with hypotheses still. And uh, it, it's, worth, it's worth knowing the history of topics as well. <coughs> the other thing I would say is that uh, on, on, the, on the precept of have, have gun will travel, is have a valuable method will travel as well. I, I found that the folks who are really capable, say, in, in say, some, some types of structural equation modeling, can, can hop them round and really make themselves useful too and get into uh, big data analyses. And remembering too, you don't need to collect your own data. You don't need to be as stupid as I am and go home every night worrying if you're going to get your next grant to bring the next wave of your cohorts in. There are huge cohorts out there that don't cost you anything, or you can collaborate with people like me who are desperate for external collaborators to come and make full use, and one never does make full use of these very large data sets as well. So is that, that's a series of things that aren't very useful, but it's filled up some time. That's very really good. We've we covered a, a lot of, of your career before um, uh, we, we go on. Who are your heroes? Yeah, I, I didn't have much time to, to, to form heroes uh, to begin with. I got into an area that was interesting. But people were kind, and it's worth remembering that. I mean, uh, Chris Brand was very kind when I came as a completely ignorant uh, undergraduate. Hans Eysenck was, was very kind. I went to see him again as, as an undergraduate at the Maudsley Hospital where he was near to retirement. And I, I've written it up already, I think, in your uh, editing book, Helmut, that I had a strange uh, feeling in that interview where I came to see him and uh, I couldn't see that there was any indication that that interview was in, ever going to end. He seemed to be entirely at my beck and call to be talked with as long as, as I was wanting to, to be there. And he was, he was uh, generous. And then I, I do have a penchant for certain types of people. I like underappreciated people with a distinctive voice in any field. And so I'm, I'm rather awkward when it comes to this. So again, my favourite composer is a little known English composer called Gerald Finzi because again I think he's underappreciated, he's got a lovely voice. My favourite writer is George Gissing because I think he's criminally underappreciated. And I thought Spearman was going to be the person, but I've more recently come to the closest I've got to hero is Godfrey Thompson. Because Godfrey Thompson, I think, is criminally underappreciated in intelligence. I think, in fact, Doug Detterman is one person who's been consistent in singing Thompson's praises. But I've uh, started doing a separate historical study of uh, Thompson. And in fact, at the Amsterdam ISIR, I gave a talk on uh, Thompson. And I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed discovering this man's amazing work on intelligence, on statistics, on education, etc., etc. 
And I remember uh, Tim Bates, who's in the audience here, telling me that the late uh, Phil Rushton had said to Tim something along the lines of, why is Ian wasting his time on that when he's got so, many other, so much other good stuff he could be doing as well? But it's, it's just absolutely captivating. And when we thought we'd finished the project on Tolson uh, a few years ago, I'd, uh, this is too long, I need to try and shorten it, uh, I discovered that his son had recently died in a house that's five minutes from my own house, and I found Thompson's private papers, and I found, for example, 30 odd lectures that he'd given, and in, they're in his own handwriting and his own typing. And the voice, I've yet to write the proper article that comes from them, but the voice that comes from that is so amazing. So this is why he's my hero. We're both from similar backgrounds, that is very poor working class backgrounds. That's not a complaint, and it's not showing off, it's just a fact in both cases, and we were both sort of catapulted by this ability thing as well. But in Thompson's case, he was producing millions of cognitive ability tests and selling them, and he decided he was never going to make any money from them because he put into place the Godfrey Thompson Trust, and all the money was ploughed back into making better cognitive tests, and he writes many times in his personal lectures that he gave to lay audiences that his life's mission was to get poor children a better education by discovering their native talent and not the social class of their parents or what they'd learned at school. And he knew it was imperfect, he knew he could never perfect this, but he wanted to dig underneath and find that there might be brightness there and all else was excluded. And he started doing it because in, in the, the northeast of England, in Northumbria, there were some schools that never sent children to full secondary education. He said, well, statistically, this just can't be true. There must be bright children, and I'm going to discover them. And they're going to get the education that their ability actually deserves. And that was his life's mission. And I think that's a great, a great thing for a hero to, to, to actually have thought about doing, is to bring about uh, equality of opportunity. And that's what he did. So yeah, I'd say Thompson, uh, but not least because I think he's underappreciated. I always want to fight for the underdog. If somebody's successful anyway, other people can look after them. I'll, I'll look after the person that nobody appreciates, uh, as far as I can. Okay. Um, before we turn this over to the audience for questions, um, is there anything else we should know about your career, professional thoughts, um, that you haven't talked about? No, I, 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 if something occurs to me during the questions, I'll interrupt. Okay. To, yeah. Well, then, then at this point, I would like to turn it over to the audience for questions. And what we'll do is, we don't have to get you on the videotape, but I think we need to get you on the microphone. So I can pass the microphone over to anyone who might have a question for Ian. Um, Ian, have you often had to compromise when people say, we'll let you have some data, but there's some restrictions on how you can handle it, and you've had to sort of follow that, and ideally you want to say, look, everything about intelligence I should publish, but I you can't. So do people put restrictions on you, and sometimes fret at them, but at the same time think, you know, it's great to get something out into the I can't. I think what you must be referring to most is that the data that we borrowed from other people was mostly for cognitive epidemiology. And no, the only restriction I can think of is something that applies to everybody. Am I right in thinking is, again, I'll ask the question because I'm not sure, is it the 1958 birth cohort in the UK <coughs> where you're not, you're not supposed to study intelligence per se. Stuart, Stuart Ritchie in the audience and Tim Bates are both nodding. I think that's got something written into it. You're not supposed to study intelligence. Yeah. That's the with, only thing. With right. reference to genetics. It's the, it's the genetic data specifically. So the, the audience is specifically to do with genetics. There you go. Uh, many thanks. Your research on cognitive epidemiology is, of course, fascinating. What implications, if any, does it have for health policy? Yeah, well, we, we actually wrote a, a paper on that, David, David Batty and Alex Weitz and I, in Psychological Science in the Public Interest, is, is that what it's called? And we decided that we should actually try and talk a bit, a bit about the implications there as well. 
And I suppose the bottom line we came out with there was this sort of phenocopy idea that until we know better, because we don't know a lot about the mechanism, it might be a good idea to do what smart people do. And, and one of the reasons I, I came up with that is that it can make a difference. So to give you a concrete example in another area, when I was a, a medical student, my wife and I lived in, in a power block in one of the poorest parts of, of Edinburgh and it had the highest infant mortality rate, is, is my memory. Uh, and a lot of the women weren't going into the local maternity hospital, so what they decided was they would bring the consultant doctors out to the local general practice, so they didn't need to go to the, to the obstetricians and gynecologists, they, they would come to them. And I think it went from being the worst area to, to one of the best, simply because they made that change, they made them act, if you like, like middle class uh, uh, folks, and, and it changed it. And so, as I say, until we know otherwise, it'd be, a, it'd be wise to, to, to copy what the smart people do. Um, I, I guess I've known and come to like and respect you over 20 years. Uh, and the thing that surprised me from the interview was the self-employed eight-year-olds and the uh, and the uh, and, and the and the patented undergraduate. Uh, and so, I guess I, I would ask, uh, what, what do you think the relative balances of, of intelligence and conscientiousness, or hard prodigious hard work, not not just for yourself, but in the population? Yeah. I, but that's an excellent question. Uh, to, to, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I won't go into the, the, the personal stuff, but yeah, just to, just to repeat, I, I have been independent in, in pocket money since, since eight, but uh, <laughs> there, there, there were days of chance they were. Uh, but I, I don't think you can overestimate, that's the right way around, isn't it? Everybody gets that wrong. I don't think you can overestimate just working hard. I never thought. Uh, by any particular great ideas. I just always liked you know, big data and, and hard work. And I just always enjoyed it. And uh, just on a personal reflection, when I did leave uh, medicine to go into academia, my wife instantly thought, at least I'll see more of it. Of course, it was precisely uh, the, 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 the reverse. And as my team know, I, I like to be in a good few hours before most of them get in in the morning. So I enjoy working from somewhere about half past six. In, in the morning, and I stand all day until I go home at night. I, I don't, uh, I don't sit down, and I just think it's it's great fun. And if you're lucky enough to have something that you enjoy that much, you don't really see hours of work. And I see some of my uh, team being like that as well. And on the on the conscientiousness side, I I say this uh, in in shame actually, because I've got a a, a bright son whom I thought wasn't one of those folks who was uh, awfully conscientious and somebody will help me out here but that science paper that said that something like was it effort was just as was more important than IQ and achievement I, I'm shamed when I say this but I photocopied that page put it in a picture frame and hung it in his bedroom to, <laughs> in order to, 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 to drive the point home probably alienating him and that's unfair to say because we, we get on very well but trying, trying to make the point that you know that, that hard work is, is really important as well. I think that's a good question actually, and uh, yeah, I don't think it was aimed at eliciting a, an admission of being average, averagely talented but hard working. But, but I wouldn't think that's a bad description of myself by myself. Well, yeah, and I want to thank you again for doing this. You were everything we thought you would be, and uh, this is just a highlight of my insight. Are you over? Thank you. Well, thank you. session and have your purpose.